Uh, brethren, <clears throat> from following the comments on Facebook, I know many of you are very keen to learn more about this wonderful order that we're about to listen to today and its history. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to hand the virtual floor over to most illustrious brother, Jonathan C. Roberts, Grand Master of the Masonic Order of Pilgrim Preceptors. Good evening, brethren. Um, you've just been told who I am, John Roberts, Grand Master of the Pilgrim Preceptors, or the Masonic Order of Pilgrim Preceptors, to give it the correct title, which is the subject I'm going to talk to you about this evening. <clears throat> Our current history was written from verbal accounts passed down through time and states that the ritual was put together by three out-of-work actors using material found at a Masonic library in Formby, Lancashire, <clears throat> in the late 1870s. Recent research by Theodore Eddie Caligaropoulos, known as Eddie, which I'll refer to him as in future, into the three actors, shows that only one named, Albert Lefray, was initiated in May 1900, became Worshipful Master in 1906, First Principal in 1908, and completed the six Allied Masonic degrees in 1925. At the time, there were six degrees, as the Order of the Secret Monitor was still part of the Allied degrees. It's therefore concluded that the ritual must have been formulated in the mid to late 1920s and so is just under 100 years old. However, its roots may well be back in the 1870s, as we will propose later. I'd first like to go through the qualifications for membership, which is why I mentioned the dates of Frey was Worshipful Master and First Principal, and also discuss the ceremonies of the Order. The Constitution states, that a candidate for admission into a conclave shall be one, a subscribing past first principle of a Royal Arch chapter under Supreme Grand Chapter or in amity therewith, and two, a subscribing past master of a craft lodge under the United Grand Lodge of England or in amity therewith. And it also accounts for a virtual past master in the United States of America as long as they are accepted as regular by United Grand Lodge. To maintain membership of the Pilgrim Perceptors, you must continue to be a subscribing member of the Craft and Royal Arch under or amity with the United Grand Lodge of England. There are three degrees in the order, that of reception, advancement and accession to the chair. The degree of reception takes place at the time when Titus was Caesar in Rome. <clears throat> and this degree marks a pilgrimage that the candidate makes in order to lay a petition before him. <clears throat> Lest the secret arts of Solomon, the rituals and the mysteries all be lost following the destruction of Jerusalem. These mysteries were deemed to be of great importance because they were given to offer up praises to the true and living God Most High in his glory, to his adoration and the welfare of our fellow man by brotherly love, relief and truth. This degree is meant to be one commemorating the early days of the craft in the present era and the manner in which the ancient mysteries came to Europe from the East. As a past first principal in Royal Arch Masonry, you'd be well acquainted with the history of the craft from the days of Moses and the first tabernacle down to the time of the destruction of the second temple, Analusis 4074, or the 70th year of the present era. Throughout the ages, a spiritual architect or perceptor Never instructed our masters, craftsmen and apprentices in the labours of the day. The precepts of Moses guided Aoli and Bezalel in the erection of the Holy Lodge. The precepts of Solomon guided Hiram of Tyre and Hiram of Biff in the Sacred Lodge, as did those of Zerubbabel guide Haggai and Joshua in the Grand or Royal Lodge. 
The degree of advancement takes place during the time of Augustine. He was considered to be the latter day illustrious preceptor, who it said brought, <coughs> brought the tenets and principles of masonry from Rome to Great Britain. It was instrumental in founding the first of the ancient lodges in Anglo-Saxon territory. It was Augustine of Canterbury who ultimately brought Prince Edwin, the son of Alfred the Great of England, to take active interest that eventually led to the opening at York in 857 AD of that lodge which Masonic historians term the York Grand Lodge. And this degree introduces the fourth or fraternal lodge. The degree of accession, known as a holy teacher, is that of the installation of an illustrious preceptor, which again reverts back to the Old, Sist the Old Testament time of Moses. The regalia worn by the members is simple but distinctive, as it was the wish of our immediate past grandmaster, Stephen Ayres, to keep cost to members as low as possible. On admission to the order, a brother wears royal arch regalia, and after receiving the first degree, that of a pilgrim, he also wears a brown collarette with the symbol of the order suspended from it. After the second degree, or advancement, he becomes a pilgrim preceptor and wears the symbol of the order, <coughs> wears the symbol of the order suspended from a white collarette, a purple sash, and a past mass, uh, sorry, a past rubberable jewel, provincial or grand chapter jewel. After accession to the chair, the collarette colour is purple, again with the symbol of the order suspended from it, the sash and a royal arch jewel. And that, brethren, if you can see it, is the symbol of the order. The units in Pilgrim Perceptors are now called conclaves, but were originally perceptories. The layout of the lodge room is in the form of a triangle. The situation of the illustrious perceptor is on the northern triangle. The other principal perceptors are situated respectively on the east and west triangles and are known as the excellent and worthy perceptors and are his right and left supports. Between them, they form a perfect triangle within which to conduct the affairs of the conclave. <clears throat> now, how did the order come into being? Well, this account will differ somewhat from our current history published with a handbook. And this is thanks to the research and a paper produced by Eddie, a Masonic historian and member in Greece. I alluded to the fact that our written history was taken from anecdotes passed down through time. And as we know, memory fades and romantic tales can abound. It was stated the order was devised by three out of work actors in the 1870s. As stated earlier, research by Eddie shows it is probable that the rituals evolved around 1925. And rather than from information found in Formby, which had neither a Masonic temple or a library, it's more likely to have been sourced in the Greater Liverpool area by these three out of work actors. Albert Lefray being the one whose name is known and whose history has been researched. The other two have remained nameless, unfortunately. Liverpool was a major port and main passageway from England to Ireland. It's widely accepted nowadays that the Irish Masons were behind the creation of numerous degrees and orders. And it's probable our three actors were inspired by an early Irish ritual of the second half of the 19th century. The stronger idea or hypothesis of Irish origin of the early ritual comes from the role and interdependency of the three principles of a pilgrim preceptor's conclave, as they coincide with the three principles of an Irish chapter rather than an English one. In Ireland, since 1862, for example, the principles were excellent king, which is equivalent to a Roman emperor, high priest, the equivalent to evangelist from Jerusalem, the excellent preceptor, 
and a chief scribe be considered equivalent to a governor of the West, the worthy preceptor. If akin to the English system, the roles would be similar to prince, prophet and high priest. Another indication that the ritual is old is the absence of deacons or sojourners. In the pilgrim preceptor's ritual, it's a martial preceptor which carries out these functions. <clears throat> when Albert Le Frey passed away, his son Eric inherited his father's papers, which included the ritual, but he did little with them until after much pestering, when he sold them to a chap called John Walker for the princely sum of a halfpenny in the 1970s. But this was after he had to it had the degrees conferred upon him. Walker then conferred the degrees to five other brethren after a meeting of the August Order of Light in Blackheath, which included Andrew Stevenson and a man known in our verbal history as John Jari. But however, it was discovered by Eddie that this John was actually <clears throat> Arthur William Jari. And it was he who photocopied the script and one of these copies has been traced <coughs> excuse me, to the archives and library at Knighty Grand Lodge. The ninth page of this script is missing, but this missing page was also mentioned by Walker in his verbal recollections of the history. The Jari photocopy kept at Knighty Grand Lodge is not only a true copy of the typewritten revised version of the ritual, in possession of Albert Le Frey, but also the earliest known historical document of the order. It comprises of three unnumbered pages and 23 numbered ones. <clears throat> the second unnumbered page states, this commemorative degree is an advancement for merit from the Holy Royal Arch of Jerusalem and restricted to those who have passed the three principles chairs of Royal Archmasons. So right from the start, a member had to be a past Zerubbabel, and at that time, therefore, unavoidably a past master. It's also interesting to note that the regalia to be worn in these early documents included a full set of Allied Masonic degree jewels. So at the time the document was drafted, a member would need to have completed all six degrees. This is not the case nowadays, nor has it been the case from the constitution of the Grand Conclave in 1984. As stated earlier, Albert Le Frey, the father of Eric, who possessed the ritual until 1978, was born in 1870, initiated in 1900, worshipful master in 1906, and first principal in 1908, and completed the Allied degrees in 1925. We must assume, therefore, that Walker's story of the three actors could not have occurred in the 1870s, but in 1925 at the earliest. So to sum up the origins of the order, we can claim with certainty that during the first quarter of the 20th century, three actors and masons, one definitely being Albert Le Frey, must have traced in the library of a Masonic Hall or Lodge somewhere in northwest England, most probably the Liverpool area, an unknown ritual of Irish origin drafted sometime after 1862, which served as the basis for their version of the original degrees of the order. In the early 1980s, one of the brethren, Howard Stokes, who had received a degree by oath, was appointed Grand Master by Walker. Stokes conferred the degree on another three brethren, including a man called Benson Catt. All at this time were members of the August Order of Light, except Jerry. The ceremonies were actually performed fully for the first time in 1986 for another member of the August Order of Light, and the secrets of the chair were communicated to five existing members, including Ben Catt, who was among those who drafted the ritual version of the installation, the Holy Teacher as it's known today. 
All of the early members were also members of many side or progressive degrees, but the convergence in the very early days was the Worshipful Society of Freemasons, Rough Masons, Wallers, Slaters, Paviers, Plasterers and Bricklayers, generally known as the Operatives. The Frames, a member of Abbey Assemblies, which I also am, and Walker was a Channel Row man. It's interesting that the founders as such were all members of the August Order of Light, except Jerry. The Order of the Pilgrim Perceptors, since its beginning, had its seat in Blackheath, a district of South East London, and more particularly in the house owned by Andrew Stevenson. This house was famous for, it was a famous Masonic centre from the early 70s until 2006, when Andrew, then aged 83, decided to move to New Zealand, where he still resides today. All those familiar with the recent history of the English progressive degrees and orders are aware that at some point Andrew Stevenson was their saviour as he hosted most of them in his house and of course served as their leader. The pur purpose of Saturday morning meetings there was to keep old and out of date Masonic orders and societies in existence. In the ample and cosy attic of the house, converted into a Masonic temple, orders like the Masonic Order of Pilgrim Perceptors, the Commemorative Order of St Thomas of Akon, the Hermetic Chapter of Spiritual Knights, uh, had their first meetings. Apart from the above orders, meetings of the August Order of Light, the Hermetic Order of Martinists, the non-Masonic fraternity of Rosy Cross were held regularly in the Stevenson abode. The aforementioned orders, due to the small capacity of the temple, at the most 20, had a low membership in the early years. Thus, the basic nucleus consisted of the same people, more or less. That's why in the 1990s we have traced almost identical membership between the Order of the Pilgrim Perceptors and the August Order of Light. The two yearly meetings of the Pilgrim Perceptors were held on the same day as two out of the four yearly meetings of the August Order of Light. It made sense to belong to both orders. Following the first regular meeting that took place on March the 8th, 1986, Stokes resigned from the office of Grand Master. And although it had been decided in that meeting that the order should meet twice yearly to precede the two meetings of the August Order of Light, the next regular meeting was not held until a year and a half later in September 1987, when John Walker was duly installed as the second Grand Master of the Order. In July 1990, Walker retired as Grand Master and died following year and in September 1993 the Deputy Grand Master and Acting Grand Master from 1990 to 93 uh, Andrew Stevenson was duly installed as the third Grand Master of the Order. A milestone in the Order's history was the consecration of the St Augustine Perceptron the basic unit, as I said earlier, was styled Perceptory in the original days. In June 1998 at Gillingham. Later on, the order's name was changed to Conclave, thus the St Augustine Conclave is considered the first Conclave and bears number one on the role of Grand Conclave. Following the first regular meeting of the order, in March 1986 until the consecration of St Augustine's in 1998. There were registered as members 43 brethren, including the nine original founders as such. In this sense, when this first congregation of 43 members were divided into two units, <clears throat> the mother conclave that ran the order was transformed into a grand conclave and immediately consecrated St Andrew's conclave with no number and reference time and memorial. 
This would signify forever that the St Andrew's Conclave not only was the oldest of all, with no constitution date, but also the Mother Conclave. It consisted of the surviving original founders and 27 more members of the second generation that had been registered up until 1998. Its scope is the admission of new members in the London area, as well as abroad, as in the recent cases of the United States of America and Greece. In the period that Andrew Stevenson was Grand Master, 93 to 2006, apart from the St Augustine Conclave number one, two more conclaves were consecrated. But in 2006, Stevenson announced his imminent emigration to New Zealand and appointed the then Grand Secretary, Benson Catt, who we mentioned earlier, as his successor. And duly installed him as Grand Master in April 2006. Benson Catt was the fourth Grand Master and he consecrated a further five conclaves, <coughs> including Mayflower number eight on February the 14th, 2010. This was a significant milestone in the history of the order. As the members of Grand Conclave consecrated for the first time a new conclave, not only outside of England and Wales, but also on a different continent altogether, the United States of America. It was given a peripatetic warrant so the conclave could meet in different states and venues. The Mayflower Conclave, thus equipped, acted as a mother conclave of a further four conclaves consecrated in the United States in 2019. By the end of 2011, Ben Catt announced his retirement from Office of Grand Master for health reasons and appointed as his successor the then Grand Marshal Stephen Michael Ayres, whom he personally installed as Grand Master in March 2011. Now Stephen Ayres, in his nine year term of office as Grand Master, consecrated a further 27 conclaves. There is no doubt that the order was at its maximum proliferation in the years 2011 to 2020, and that is totally to the credit of the leadership of Grand Master Stephen Ayres. In that period, the constitution and regulations of the order were revised. The regalia of the various offices were perfected and completed. New offices were introduced to assist the already existing ones of the Grand Conclave and a regional structure was created. Five regional conclaves were formed for Eastern Counties, Heart of England, Northern Counties, Southern Counties and the United States of America. A further milestone in the Order's history was added when numbers of members sorry, of Grand Conclave consecrated a new unit on the continent of Europe, an event that took place in Athens in April 2019. During the annual meeting of Grand Conclave in Exeter in June 2019, the late Grand Master, most illustrious brother Stephen Ayres, announced his intention to retire from his exalted office. And as per custom, he announced his successor in Mar on the 6th of March 2020 at the executive meeting. And it was to be the Grand Marshal, which is myself, or was myself. Um, a few days later, unfortunately, on March the 31st, 2020, the Grand Master suddenly passed away from natural causes, putting an unexpected end to a most prolific historical period of the Order. I then became the sixth Grand Master of the Order from the date of Grand Conclave in June by proclamation. The present situation of the Order is a membership of around 700, with 850 subscribing members. We have 36 conclaves, including St Andrew's Time Memorial, the original, and a number zero, which is the Grand Master's personal conclave. We do have a number of candidates ready to come into the order when COVID-19 and the government rules allow. We have at least three new conclaves to be consecrated. And naturally, as with all orders, we welcome additional candidates. Brethren, I hope you found that interesting.
um, I've concluded. I'll be happy to try and answer any questions you may have. Master, thank you ever so much. Fabulous. Um, I can see, uh, I know for sure it's going to be piquing a lot of interest um, and uh, there are questions that are coming through so I'm going to move straight to them. Um, the first one I've got was sent to me, um, the August Order of Light, where is it based and how can one join? Um, it's based in Halifax. Perfect. I'm not sure who asked the question. I still can't remember who asked the question, but no, thank you very much. So it's in Halifax. Uh, and to join the order? Um, I'm not entirely sure. That's okay. So we can maybe we can go, we can get that information and pass it on to uh, the brother who asked the question. Um, next, could we go to brother Dudley, please? Hi, Dudley. Hi, mate. Um, thank you, Grand Master, for a very interesting talk. Um, I'm interested to know why the principal um, preceptor, shall we say, is situated in the north, which traditionally is the dark side of craft, as you know. He's situated in the north because that was the direction mason, uh, the masonry, it came from Jerusalem to Rome, which is a northerly direction. So that's why he's based in the north. Roughly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, roughly. It's, it's, it's Freemasonry. It's taken with a little bit of... Uh, no, it's symbolic, I know, yes, absolutely. A little, little bit of leeway. Um, I mean, the operatives don't have the East as the main thing. They have the West, so not, not every order is the same. That's part of the joy of belonging to different orders. I am a candidate in waiting, by the way. I've been waiting a long time. <laughs> Thanks, could just, John. Could I just add that the north is the site of the pole star, which is the un uh, unvariable site in in the heavens. Correct. I was about to say that, Trevor. <laughs> yeah, she's yeah, quite right. I know it's in the ritual. <laughs> Thank you, brethren. Do we have any further questions? I'm just waiting for a list to come through. John, you may be let off lightly here, but um, I'm just waiting for everyone to put their hands up. I, I thought I'd put my hand up, but obviously not. Can Hi, I Simon. You're well. <laughs> um, a very simple one. It's um, oh, Thank you for that speech. It was an order I'd never heard of. So uh, that was quite interesting. And again, another one that's giving me more something to look into. Uh, but my question, um, it was around... Uh, Blackheath. You said there was mm. uh, Andrew Stevenson House in Blackheath. So I've never heard of. Thought I knew Blackheath very well. Where, whereabouts is that? And what was it? Do you know, I'm one of the newer generation. There are members that I know in various orders who used to attend Blackheath. Um, I've never been there. I've seen a photograph of the house, but I couldn't tell you its actual situation. Okay. Even Google doesn't know about it because I had a look. Uh, I mean, Andrew Stevenson's house is literally not an office type block. It's Andrew Stevenson's house. It's his own personal house. Get the Blackheath to the um, Greenwich Park and it is to the east of Greenwich Park. And I can't think of the name of the street. I know that I know roughly where it is, but it's on the it's a, the, on the A two side of Blackheath. It's the um, the Greenwich side of not uh, my minute. Yeah. Looking at Blackheath at the moment, I'm, I've got Blackheath Park in, in front of me, of which the where the deer park is. Yeah. You go to the left of the deer park, and it is coming towards what would be um, part of the South Circular, going towards Blackwall Tunnel. Okay, thank you. I've, I've gave me a smaller patch to look look for it in. Thanks, well, thanks, thanks. Uh, David. Google Maps Burgess for that. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> if you want to contact me, I'll give you. I can tell you where it. I, I'll drop you a note and tell you where it is. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Pleasure. Thanks, Simon. Uh, next, could we go to Matthew? Hi, Matthew. Hello. Hi, Matthew. 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 Hi,
hello there and it's uh, thank you very much indeed graham asked a fantastic talk really interesting can you explain why an order called pilgrim preceptors took the name preceptory out and called it a conclave that seems a, a strange thing to do i, just, oh, I, I it's relevant just, i'm just curious well i would tend to agree with you um pilgrim preceptors perceptory it would seem logical i have no records um or we have no records as to why the name was changed so i'm afraid i can't help you on that it does seem illogical um so you are, that's, can, can i butt in <laughs> it's glenn here i think I you'll find um the idea was to avoid any confusion with the Christian orders by keeping it as a preceptory. Oh, thanks, Glyn. Yeah, I, I said that having said that, of course, it didn't do the job because Red Cross of Constantine have conclaves as well. But uh, it, there was some debate about it, as I recall. Yeah, that's true. I, I mean, I can understand that because um, the idea when many of the original conclaves were called St. Augustine or whatever, when we formed one of ours in London, we wanted it to correspond with our other units and call it St. James. And the Grand Master wouldn't allow it. He said, we've got far too many saints. It's not a Christian order. Um, and he changed a couple of other things in the ritual as well. Um, so he didn't put our um, Jewish brethren off from joining. Thank you very much. Really useful answer. Thank you, Matthew. Next, could we go to Barth by Hi, Barth. Hi, hi Amit. Uh, uh, I, I should say uh, very late good evening to Grand Master Jonathan. It's now all, you know, well beyond uh, uh, midnight here in Chennai. I just wanted to uh, say that last time uh, Grand Master was in Chennai was for the reformment of the KT, the secretary. So hopefully his next visit to India will be for the consecration of uh, pilgrim conclave. So we're looking forward to that and some of us have already become members of the order and you know, once this COVID uh, pandemic is over, we will be submitting the petition and hopefully we will be able to It's good to hear from you, Barrett, but you're breaking up now. Just wanted to say that we're looking forward to having the uh, pilgrim conclave in China under your uh, uh, consecration and then to be consecrated by you and your team. we we'll see what we can do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bharat Bhai. Next, could we go to Eric? Hi, Eric Burt. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, John. It was an interesting talk. I have in front of me the origins of the Pilgrim Preceptors which was the second edition, which was published in 2012. And I think I gathered from your talk that that's been superseded, that the, uh, the origins and the history has been rewritten in some way. And I haven't got hold of a copy of that yet. I must make you're sure. Not, you're not alone. <laughs> I'm probably the only person or one of only three or four people who act have actually got Eddie's research because it's only been completed recently. The next time the um, history of the order is published, it will be modified to take into account Eddie's research. I mean, essentially, it's a very similar, the history is very similar. The date 1870, I would suggest, has probably been misinterpreted as where the original ritual was taken from that they uh, took as the basis of their the Pilgrim Perceptors ritual, but the actual Pilgrim Perceptors ritual couldn't have been produced prior to 1925 because um, the precepts for belonging to the order was to be a past master, past the rubbable, and to have done all of the Allied degrees. And Lefray hadn't done that until 1925. So it's um, when things are handed down, things can get confused. So I think it's the timeline more that's been 
uh, moved rather than the actual history, although it could, couldn't have been from documents found in Formby because Formby didn't have a Masonic temple or a library. John, Formby does no, have a library. No, it well, will be. do now. But, published. but in the uh, existing history, it uh, talks about it being in the late 1870s and the three actors were in this hotel in Manchester. Yes, well, they weren't. He was only born in 1900, Derek. Sorry, he was only born in, sorry, he was born in 1870. So he couldn't have written the ritual in 1870. All right, I look forward to the uh, revised ritual when it's published. Anyway, thanks, John. Yeah, revised history. We're not going to revise the rituals again. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. Um, I've got a question that's coming from Andrew Armbrister. Um, you may or may not be able to answer this one, Grandmaster, but where, from where can we obtain a list of conclaves? Um, I see East Anglia has a website, but cannot find a UK-wide one. No, there's not a UK-wide one um, yet. We're working on it. Um, where can you find one? You, you probably can't. You could go through, if there's a question on... Um, East Anglia's website. I can't remember exactly what's on it. Um, otherwise, you would have to go through possibly myself or the Grand Secretary and we could help. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks, Andrew. Next, could we go to Brother Philip Yoss, please? Hi, Philip. Hello, Amit. Uh, thank you for this uh, talk. I was wondering, are there any conclaves over here in Spain? And if not, uh, are there any uh, plans of establishing one? Thank you. Um, no, we don't have any in Spain. I guess, well, I don't know if the nearest one would be um, would be Athens or, or London. Depends on the flight, price of flights. But um, as no one has contacted us re- um, Spanish conclaves or such. So no is the answer. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Philippe. Um, I've got another question here from Vincent Puchan. I hope I've uh, pronounced it correctly. How many officers per conclave? Um, oh, that's a good question. Uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No, you go away with about nine. About nine. Mm. Perfect. Mm. St. Andrew's, con oh, St. Andrew's, St. Andrew's St. Andrew's conclave has got 14. Yes. Um, you can get away. There are optional offices that you can have in addition, such as chaplain, organist. But the main offices, you get away with about nine. Thank you. Um, next, could we go to Brother Alan Silvestro, please, in Brazil? Good evening. What a pleasure to hear from you, sir. Well, first of all, I would like to know, because when first I have heard about this uh, order, I saw a photo with uh, a floor carpet. Uh, I would like to know if that carpet is used on the, the advancement and reception, and if there is anything that you could share for us related to the purple color, related to regalia, and so on. If there's something you would like to add, I would be joyful. Thank you. Um, purple, uh, Imperial Rome used purple. It's based on... Uh... Uh, someone's waving a tie at me, yes, the ties are purple um, with the logo. And that's also what the floor carpet is. It's a purple, purple carpet with the symbol of the order on it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next, could we go to Brother Nick Legrees, please? Mm. Brother Nick. I'm just demuting myself. Oh. Evening, John. Good, Hi, uh, good lecture. Um, just a, a silly question, really. Is there any plans to, f I know we have regions, is there any plans to form districts or provinces? No. No. I don't see any reason to have 
districts or provinces, regions are quite an adequate title. They fit in with Roman history, if you like. Governors fit in with Roman history, which is essentially the basis of certainly the first, the first degree. Um, so no is the answer. Okay. All, will be, all will be revealed in um, due course on that one. I eagerly await. <laughs> Secrets and mysteries are in ma within masonry. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, Richard, jump. Richard, would you like to come on? You caught me just before I was going to shoot off. Yes, of course I'd like, like to come on. Um, I just put up a posting to say that it's the first time I've actually learned more about an order before I join. Um, I'm hoping that won't be too long before I can actually make it to England to, to do that. And yes, we're hoping to bring um, Pilgrim's Preceptory to Malta with... <clears throat> Eddie's assistant, and I've got cats all over the place. Sorry. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Now I must shoot for my next uh, talk. Thank you. Good Bye. luck with that, Richard. Thank you. Good to hear from you, Richard. Um, next, could we go to Brother Ted in New York, please? Hi, Ted. How are you doing? Uh, Master, it's the uh, Mayflower number eight, which is in uh, AMD, New York, uh, uh, USA, is that under the control of the UK or is it independent of? No, it comes under the UK. Okay, thank you so much. Wonderful, brethren, I have no more hands up in the questions uh, participant section. So I think, uh, Grandmaster, I think we're done. Or we're done for today. I think I believe. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for listening. May I just say, yeah, an absolute. You know, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much for your time. I know that these can be quite time sapping, and uh, you've probably got an awful lot on your plate already as it is. Um, brethren, just a reminder, it is being recorded, will be on our YouTube channel hopefully by the weekend. If you have got any further questions. Um, Direct them to the Grand Secretary, I guess? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, and like I said, if you'd like to know more about the order, please do let us know, get in contact, and we will attempt to put you in the right direction, brethren. Um, before we do go, I'd just like to announce our winners for the two mugs. Of course, the answer was to the question was Rudyard Kipling. So well done to Alan in uh, Brazil and to Philip Jos in Spain. It's going to cost us quite a bit this week to get these mugs sent out, <laughs> but well done to you both. And uh, Martin Smith, thank you ever so much for uh, passing the baton on there. Um, really appreciate that. Right, brethren, one more thing before we disappear for tonight. We've got, as promised, we are bringing back Worshipful Brother Martin Folks next week, and he will take us through the journey of the hermet hermetic art of memory. I know it's one that you've requested for us to bring back, so he will be on next week, um, and I wish to see you all again. Brethren, stay safe, keep healthy, look after yourselves and your loved ones. Good night, everybody. Good night. Peace to all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.